Welcome to the CCFR Radio Podcast, your source for news, updates, and stories from the CCFR. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 91 of the CCFR Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Giltaka. Thanks for joining me again today on the podcast. I got a huge show, like a huge show. And um, so this episode, there's going to be a lot of news, uh, a lot of things we're going to talk about. Um, I've got a sneak peek of Gun Ban Canada Exposed Episode 7, which is the one hour special to the series wrap up. I've got a sneak peek for you, a couple of scenes that um, I've edited together to just show you kind of what to expect, which is exciting. I think it should air in the next week or two. Um, and, uh, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. So first, and I got my list to keep me, <laughs> keep me on track. So I don't bore you guys too bad. Uh, but first let's talk about our sponsors. So, uh, our first sponsor is Vortex, the force of optics. So thanks every, uh, very much for, uh, to everyone over at Vortex Canada for continuing to support the podcast. We truly appreciate all the help again, Vortex, the force of optics. And of course, our friends over at um, SCI International, the Saskatchewan Rivers chapter. Uh, so thanks very much to the Sask Rivers chapter of SCI for the big donation they made a little while back and also for sponsoring the podcast long term. You can check out all of the great work that they do um, by uh, visiting them at their websites at saskriversci.com. That's saskriversci.com. All right. Now I've got a big list of stuff that I want to try to get through fairly quickly. And it's been a little bit busy as I, as, as always. And so I'm a little bit, my mind's a little bit scrambled. So I got to stick to my list and hopefully we can get through this whole list uh, fairly quickly. So uh, first thing, so today on the podcast, we're going to draw for the winner of the firearm rights or human rights neon sign, right? The light up 2021 sign contest. And, uh, and we're going to unveil the next sign that we're going to raffle off, which is a cool one. This one should get a, a great response. And then um, I'll talk about another rule that we're adding to the contest to make it even more appealing to enter and to donate to the CCFR. So we'll talk about that when Wilson gets on. And I wanted to just address an interview I did with Jill Bennett on uh, CKNW Talk Radio in Vancouver. And if you heard that, that interview, I don't know if there's a copy of it up anywhere, but if you heard it, I was brought on to talk about uh, straw purchasing because I guess in this uh, in this big gang war we have going on in the uh, Vancouver metro area right now, there's been multiple shootings. There's a shooting at an ice rink. There was, a, I think, two shootings, two shootings at a mall, one in front of the Toys R Us and, uh, and then one in, at Vancouver International Airport. And um, so this gang war is raging on. Broad daylight public shootings... Uh, in in busy areas, and uh, and the gun ban has done nothing to stop it. Bill Blair has done hasn't lifted a finger to stop any of this stuff. Right, Ra the the gang wars rage on. I mean, I can't take my AR to the range. I still have it, but I can't take it to the range because of this apparently. Right, so it's you know anyone that jumps on board with this kind of stuff, they just they don't know anything about this kind of stuff, and and uh, and that's frustrating. But um, when it comes to straw purchasing, I guess what happened was. This uh, some uh, assistant superintendent at the RCMP um, by the last name of McDonald, I think I can't remember Wayne McDonald. I don't know, but anyway, if you're if you're familiar with the story, you know who that is. And um, he had mentioned that forty percent of the guns that they have seized in Vancouver over the last or in, in southwestern BC over the last year or whatever were domestically sourced and were tracked to straw purchasing or whatever. I forget what the comment is. Now, if if that's true, then that's a problem. Um, criminals getting a hold of guns in any manner is a problem. When it comes to straw purchasing, I think what uh, what I wanted to tell Jill Bennett and her listeners is understand what's going on when these guys mention straw purchasing. If they're saying the reason why these shootings are happening is because of straw purchasing, of course, that's, that's insane. Straw purchasing occurs um, as a result of a, um, a financial motivation, a financial incentive. So gang members will get someone that has never done anything wrong that they've been caught for, I guess, in their life. They'll get them to go through the, the, um, the licensing process and then they can buy guns for gangs. Or you might have 
um, somebody that gets a gun license and is just a bad person, and then they make contact with gangs and sell them guns. Well, the only motivation to get guns from uh, through legal means is just a financial motive. They're, they're going to be cheaper than what they'd have to pay for for smuggled guns. But I assure you, these gangs have they don't have money problems, right? They don't have tax issues, right? So if they weren't able to get these guns through straw purchasing, then they would just pay the premium and get them smuggled in across the border, much like most criminals do. So the consensus um, across the country seems to be 70% of, of um, crime guns come from, uh, are illegally imported, primarily from the United States. 30% are stolen. And then something like a fraction of 1% come from straw purchasers. So if you remember in Gun Ban Canada Exposed uh, episode th two, episode two, uh, we looked at straw purchasing and uh, two independent researchers came up with 47 instances, 47 people that were convicted of straw purchasing over a period of 22 years. So it almost never happens. Um, on the other side, on the concerned citizen side, just remember that even when a straw purchaser, even though it's just one guy every once in a while, they traffic up to 40, 50 guns. I think the highest number I ever saw was 50 guns, which 50 illegal guns on our streets are, is a problem. Um, but those convictions prove that police can go and they can find these people, which is, which is a good thing, right? But even when a licensed gun owner commits straw purchasing, which is a, a, it's a heinous, heinous crime, like really, because it's really a betrayal of the public trust too, right? When they do something like that, they should face a real penalty. So there was a guy in British Columbia that just got um, convicted for straw purchasing, I think March of this year. And what do you get? Three years. Why three years? That was the minimum, man. That's the mandatory minimum that the conservatives actually put in that the Liberals, ra you know, rail against. Oh, mandatory minimums for these this kind of victimless crime. You know, this is ridiculous. And uh, and then at the same time, they're like, oh, nobody can be trusted to own a firearm legally and and, and lawfully, right? So <laughs> this is the upside down world of uh, of liberal uh, liberal party ruled Canada. So just remember, it happens. It almost never happens, right? And what what is it like? Um, you know, seven one thousandths of one percent of gun owners engage in this kind of activity. Um, it even is not a, a large, um, doesn't represent a large portion of the volume of guns hitting the streets. Maybe in in a in a in a metropolitan area, it might because you might have one or two straw purchasers that did it, which skews the skews the the uh, the statistics. And remember, in Canada, despite the spectacular nature of these daytime shootings, people don't get murdered very often in Canada with firearms. Um, somewhere around 200 on average, depending on the year, in a nation of 37 million people. So if there's a gang war like we have in Vancouver right now, and if 10 or 15 people are killed, and then there's a gang war in Toronto, and another 25 are killed, that skews the numbers so dramatically. That results in a in a 60%, 50 or 60%, well, no, sorry, yeah, um, yeah, like a 40, 40 to 50% increase in firearm-related homicide. So when when the numbers come out for 2021, you know, gun the anti-gun folks will be like, "Well, there's a 50% increase. Look at what, you know, it's like <laughs> there was only 200 people to begin with on average per year. So one gang war can skew all those numbers. And you know what? Peace between gangs for 2 years could skew all the other numbers. Even if even if gun control was ratcheted down and the gangs stayed quiet, that would ratchet the numbers down. And then everybody would be like, wow, these numbers don't make sense, right? So you just really under, have to understand, I know I went on and on about it. I'm trying to make this quick, but you have to understand how these statistics are compiled and what they really mean. It's very difficult to find out what that means when it comes to a licensing process or authorization to transport or uh, firearm registration or safe storage regulations or any of these, you know, the regulation of ranges, like none of this stuff has anything to do with people being murdered with guns. It has nothing to do with suicide with guns either. So anyway, interesting. Um, you know what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to show you guys a sneak peek of the upcoming episode seven, the finale, the series finale of Gun Band Canada Exposed. Check it out. One of the most common sense measures we highlighted was the horrifying lack of action on behalf of the government regarding suicide. 988 
three digits that could make all the difference in saving lives in Canada as it could in the US. It's the, not, it's the mental health equivalent of 911. If you look at the many ways that uh, people end their lives, um, guns would be only a small part of it. I reached out to uh, all the federal cabinet ministers who are involved in their portfolios in suicide prevention. I reached out to MPs and senators um, and I was really quite amazed that all I got was silence on the other end. And I have always said that silence is not the right response when suicide is the subject. All Canadians could have used the support of a 988 system over the last year, the year of the pandemic, and long before that. But no one could be bothered to implement, let's say, a $5 million decision to help hundreds of thousands of distressed Canadians. The good news is, about two months after we aired episode one, the House of Commons passed a motion to move forward with the implementation of 988. This was a result of the tireless efforts of people like Kathleen Finley and help from Conservative MP Todd Doherty. Multiple victim public shootings don't happen very often in Canada. In fact, there have been between nine and 17 of these events since 1967, again, depending on how you define them. Also, keep in mind an estimated 86 Canadians have been killed in mass shootings over the last 55 years. After an incredible amount of effort and support from the community itself, Marcel Wilson's One by One movement here in 2021 still has not received any significant funding from the federal government. Apparently, there are hundreds of millions of tax dollars circulating around to address these problems. Money promised from all the way back in 2015. They twisted the narrative on us halfway through um, and really started focusing on gun bans. The question on every concerned mind should be, where's all this money? Who has it? This is hundreds of millions of dollars. We reached out to Minister Blair's office to see where this money's gone and here's what they sent back. After six years excluding funds given to law enforcement, somewhere around $90 million has been allocated. I thought it was $327 million over five years and $100 million per year after that. By now, three to $400 million should have been distributed. Many casual gun owners think all this is no big deal. They think that the government and the anti-gun organizations will stop just short of banning the guns that they own. Look at how far this has gone in five years. In fact, one of the key members of the anti-gun doctors group recently made this statement about hunting. I think it's time to accept what Canadians are saying, which is, you know, the days of, you know, hunting for your family and providing for your family. Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent it happens, but let's be real. People do not go and, you know, shoot 20 deer and feed their family venison every night. First of all, the family would reject that because venison is not that great. And, uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's time, I think, that we, we acknowledge what Canadians are saying, which is, you know, the days of the, you know, of the pioneer lifestyle, they're, they're long since gone. The Liberal government is literally using medical doctors to get Canadians to go along with ending firearm ownership and next hunting. And rest assured, if they're confronted about this statement, they'll backpedal. They don't want to risk all 2.3 million firearm owners standing together on this issue. They're careful. They want to eliminate one segment of our community at a time. There's absolutely nothing in our platform proposals that in any way restricts the legitimate, lawful and safe activities of hunting and sports shooting in this country. There's nothing in our platform today that is intended to interfere with the legitimate lawful activities of hunting and sports shooting in Canada. I want to assure hunters and farmers and target shooters in this country that nothing that we are doing today or will do in the future is intended to interfere with this lawful, responsible and legal activity. All right, so hopefully that uh, looks interesting to you. It was a lot of work doing that episode and um I'm going to make an extra announcement actually right now. Now that this is over, when I try to do this one hour episode, it was way long. And I'm like, oh, what can I cut out of here? It's like, these are all important things. So I ended up cutting quite a bit of material out of this to fit it into 
in this episode, I had 41, 41 and a half minutes of content that I could could produce because you have the the um, the sponsor bumpers and all the rest of that stuff, right? And the the uh, the intros and outros, the graphics, all that stuff. So anyway, so I talked to Wild TV, the the people over there, and I said, you know what? I think I think maybe in a couple of months, in a few months, I need a little bit of rest. I got other work at the CCFR to catch up with, um, and then I need to rest a little bit because I haven't had a vacation in probably a year and a half. So um, I got to take a few weeks off at some point. Um, I'd like to do a one hour uh, Gunman Canada exposed addendum show, maybe in about three months from now. So they were really happy with what Gunman Canada exposed did. And so they said, absolutely, we'd like to work with you. And uh, so look forward to that. So we're not done with TV. I'm even thinking of maybe doing a half hour or one hour every two or three months to keep people updated on what's going on and keep them apprised of of the behavior of politicians and 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 doctors and uh, and people in the Canadian ruling class, because you know what, nobody else is going to tell you that stuff. So, all right, next. Um, okay, here's an interesting thing. So I was on CGN, okay, and I was what was this? What was this thread? This was. Oh, um, somebody had posted uh, episode ninety of the podcast, and so usually it doesn't, these podcasts don't, you don't get a lot of conversation. That conversation typically happens more on the YouTube channel on the, in the comments under the video. But, uh, there was a little discussion that broke out. And one guy who is, um, bandits said, is it just me or did the CCFR have a super secret program they were going on about a year or two back, um, that never amounted to anything? Question mark, question mark. And, so there was a little bit of bantering back and forth about it. And then someone, and bandits actually, found a video that I did in, in the middle of December 2019 that said, hey, you know, there's something big coming up. It's the biggest thing ever, rah, rah, rah. And these are the stuff that we usually talk about our projects. And, and the reason for that is we always want to make things bigger and better because we're trying everything that we possibly can in every area that we can to save our guns or at least make it so that we're not so distraught that we just want to drive off a bridge somewhere um, if if all of our guns get banned and we have nothing but brake actions or something at least i can look back as a gun owner from my perspective and say well i tried everything i possibly could rather than to say well i complained about other people trying things um, or i was part of a group and i just you know threw rocks at other groups and what they were trying and you know, and really didn't do much. And now I've lost all my guns, right? It's just, that would be hard for me to take. I want to look back and say, you know what? Uh, I did everything I could. It just didn't work. Or maybe one of the things that we do works. Wouldn't that be something? And we save our guns. Maybe we'll get the guns that it just got banned back. I don't know. I would love that. So anyway, what he was talking about was the national education program. And it was going to be the biggest, most, most, um, ambitious project that we ever took on. So yeah, I don't think, I don't think I ever followed up on that. So bandits, this is for you. So what that was, so I wrote this stuff down, hang on. All right. I can't tell you everything that was in that program because if the world can go back to semi-normal, we might be able to actually do this. Okay. So bear with me here. So what it was, was it was a program that was designed to reach out to all the people that don't run into us on social media or hear us on the podcast or see us at gun shows or whatever, really, really reach out to the mainstream and provide just another view on everything, which is what the CCFR was mandated to do in the beginning, what we've done all along as best that we can, right? Because, you know, we are unfairly discriminated against at every cor at every turn. So it's very difficult to do that, but somebody has to try to do it. So Basically, the core of this program was um, some written materials, unlike anything you've ever seen. We had it all laid out and everything. It was just going to be awesome. And then that written material um, refers to an online quiz that if you complete this quiz, these two quizzes, a basic and advanced quiz, um, basically your name is entered for a $50 Amazon gift card. Okay. So then what we are going to do is we are going to do national advertising. So newspapers, television, banner ads, that kind of thing, 
telling people, driving them to this quiz, and also telling them that they can they can receive in the mail free written materials, right? This this publication uh, for free that would have all these all this information. And I wanted I don't want to get too detailed on what we were going to send them. Then at the same so that's all driving people to the quiz to test what they really know about gun control and about guns and private firearm ownership in Canada. And then we also, there was a feed on the street, a community element of this thing. The biggest nationwide um, participating activity for gun owners ever, right? Bigger than a, a march, just like in every every city and small town in the country was our was our goal to get these materials in the hands of everyday Canadians. And, um, and then there's the mail out portion of it. So this whole thing, this was, this was going to cost somewhere between 300 and 500, 350, I think $550,000. And it was going to get information into the hands of, we we're hoping maybe 50 to a hundred thousand people that, that we, where we had, had no other opportunity to reach them. Right. And really, again, at the end of the day, and I know I'm going on and on about it, but I want to just tell you what the rationale is. At the end of the day, if most Canadians knew anything about private firearm ownership in Canada, they wouldn't support gun bans. They'd be like, this is a red herring, man. I'm being fooled, right? They, they just, if they really knew the facts, but they don't, right? They, and we don't have access to, to people like the mainstream media and the government does. I mean, the government has bought most of the most of most of media to some degree you know if you're in media don't fly off the handle um you know what i just said was is largely true you don't want to say too much bad about the government or you won't get access to them and you won't get grants if you're in print media uh, or you're at the cbc right so you know it is what it is let's just be honest with each other so what did get done out of that project if you uh if you notice the so anyway actually let's talk about the timeline real quick so the timeline was i was talking about december i had the plan laid out and we started building materials so december january 2020 <laughs> february 2020 in february 2020 i was working on the online quiz and the redevelopment of gundebate.ca um, and of course here comes covid and by march the world shut down so i'm like okay the most impart, important part of this thing which really was the feed on the street across the country in every city and every town in the country, that part is gone. And I'm like, this is a fully integrated marketing campaign. So that means many different types of activities that all stream um, feeding into one main um, marketing message and or marketing mechanism, right? So if you have big chunks of that missing, forget it, don't spend the money, right? But what we did do is we did do the uh, the online quiz. If you go to gundebate.ca right now, the quiz is there. We did run the contest. We did award all the winners their $50 Amazon gift certificates. We gave away about half as many as we wanted to. And we were even thinking of making them a $100 gift certificate. So it's a significant prize, right, to, to take these things. And if you go through the quiz itself, you'll see, you know, there's videos and extra and, and, um, and research links and everything for every question. When you get it right or wrong, you can see why what we said was true. So really very deep. It was a tremendous amount of work to do that. Um, the written materials were laid out, but they never got done because we had no, nobody could hand them out. Basically the national advertising portion of it, we repurposed that to promote public awareness about our lawsuit um, for our property rights lawsuit, right? Against the government. So if you remember what that was, that was 68 full page ads, which were open letters and infographics and sponsored articles, 68 full page pieces of content across 17 newspapers across the entire country. So we did that. And that, that integrated campaign was to drive people to a web domain called propertyjustice.ca. So you can go there right now if you want to check it out and see what was there when people got there. So all of that material was driving people to a website. And that's one of the ways that we can measure whether or not we're reaching anyone. And so when you got there, well, there's a brand new explainer video for property rights, um, that's sitting there and then some other information. And it's like, hey, do you want to learn more? Do you want to donate to the CCFR's legal fund? Do you, you know, do you care about this? That kind of stuff. So propertyrights.ca, you can go there and check that out. So that, that campaign was about, after tax, was about $250,000, never been done on behalf of gun owners before. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't, I would have loved it to be 
more effective, more people had gone there, see a bigger effect, but you don't know until you try. And if you just go buy, you know, you know, five full page ads once, you're not going to see what that effect is. So as I said, we're trying everything that we possibly can. Um, so anyway, that's how you can go check that out. So we did do the, um, the online quiz that got done and we did the national advertising campaign though we repurposed it for the, um, the uh, lawsuit. Anyway, last thing I want to say about that is when people like bandits ask about those things, I'm more than happy to answer that. Like, I think that's a great question. And because, because we, we run through so many projects here, I forget about that stuff four months after I've said it, right? So asking those kinds of questions, I'm always happy to answer and what, what happened or did we do parts of it and where did it get repurposed and all that stuff. And the reason for that is at the CCFR, like we have no scandals. There are no scandals. There's no cover-ups. There's no lies here, right? So ask me any question and I will answer it. No problem at all. So that's what happened there. All right. And um, yeah, okay, I'm going to bring... I'm going to bring on Wilson in a minute. We're going to talk about two things. Um, one is the Mass Casualty Commission for the events that happened in Nova Scotia. Um, I'll break the news to you right now, and then we'll talk about it in uh, in detail with Wilson. But uh, we applied to uh, for standing at the commission to bring expertise about private firearm ownership and how uh, people like the perpetrator could acquire firearms and whether or not more gun control would have played a, a role to mitigate what he did or whatever. We've been granted status uh, standing in the commission. So we'll be participating in that commission along with Wendy Sukir of uh, the Coalition for Gun Control. So, you know, this is this is a big deal. You know what? I'm not going to talk too much about it. We'll bring on Wilson. All right. So that's uh, those are all the updates I have for you for now. All right. Stand by. All right, on the Skype, I've got Wilson. Wilson. Giltaka, how you doing? I'm doing just fantastic, man. How are you? I love that. That's hey, a nice positive like that. answer. Yeah, that's the that's yeah. the not tired rod now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah we got to uh, get a little rest because there's lots more coming. Well, I'm acting. I'm, doing... I'm acting like I'm not tired. <laughs> I'm doing well. It's a beautiful day here in the nation's capital, a sunny, balmy high of 22 degrees. And uh, yeah. That's about it. Well, we've been rocking on the weather front in southwestern British Columbia. It's been in the 20s every day for weeks, and uh, we've been partying. So Good for you. Now yeah. we've had, uh, I think we had thir 13 out of 15 days it rained here. So we're finally, we've got a nice forecast for the next week, which is great because it lets me take my lap laptop out in the backyard and get some work done out in the sun. And yeah. Fantastic. I love it. Awesome. All right. Let's get to business. Um, okay. First thing, the Mass Casualty Commission, which is yeah. a uh, which is the commission set up to find out what really went went wrong, what really happened in Nova Scotia. Um, we were we we got on the uh, on the committee, so that's pretty cool. That's right. So this is a public inquiry. Uh, this is the one that the families had to fight for um, to get, and it's a nonpartisan, not, not run by government inquiry um, with that's supposed to be independent and impartial. And the idea here is they're going to look into, you know, what went wrong, what maybe could have been done and what could be done better in the future. And I think this hopefully um, will at least bring some peace and closure to the families. I mean, they'll never get real true justice at this point. But um, yeah, I think like all Canadians, I never want to see something like this happen again, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just uh, I have a clip of the um, of the announcement. So check this out. We have received two applications from firearms organizations, including the Canadian Coalition for Gun Control and the Canadian Coalition for Firearms Rights. The use of firearms represents an important aspect of our mandate. These groups can continue to this work in an informative and balanced way. They are granted the right to participate on those aspects of our mandate dealing with the use of firearms. This can be done in a variety of ways, including providing expert reports and participating in expert roundtable decisions. Okay, so, you know, um, the, uh, the request for applicants went out. Um, I saw that. I thought, you know what, the... 
gun owners should have a seat at the table because inevitably gun control will be brought into this. And even if gun control, like in this particular, I don't want to get too long because we've got lots to do together today, but gun control will get brought up even though this guy smuggled his gun. He was a, he was a gun smuggler and a drug smuggler, apparently that had some mm-hmm. relationship with the RCMP. We don't know what that is and, and whatnot. So, you know, he would have got guns regardless of gun control in Canada, but forget all that anti-gun groups will certainly use this as an opportunity to, to try to push gun control and to punish people like me and you and, and all of our members and all gun owners in Canada. So we definitely need to bring our side of the story when it comes to advising on regulation um, to, to this commission. And, you know, yeah. and we, we, we have to make sure that our voices are, are heard. And uh, so anyway, we're on there. And apparently we were the only gun group that actually applied to be on the, on the committee. So, you know, we're happy we're on it. Yeah, well, they actually, they reached out to us uh, in the beginning and you and I spoke about about it. I sort of uh, sent this over to your desk instead of mine. And um, yeah, you've been working away on this. So I do think it's important, although um, thankfully this, uh, this heinous crime wasn't committed by somebody from within our community. You're a hundred percent right. Uh, we've already seen it's been the, this event was the catalyst for the liberal May 1 gun ban, um, which of course only affects the people in our community who aren't the ones committing the violence. So I think it's um, it's great to ensure that gun owners do have a voice at the table and that somebody is there to defend them because for too long now, gun owners haven't really had that type of representation. So yeah, I'm I'm really proud of you getting on there and proud of the CCFR for you know, the place that we're in now and um, how hard we work. And I really, really hope something, um, you know, that there's some sort of conclusion that comes out of this public inquiry into what happened. I really hope that for the families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope so too. And I hope the truth, I don't care what the truth is. I just always want the truth. That's it. I I don't care what it is because the truth is what it is. So I'm hoping all that will come out. Anyway, um, yeah. Great opportunity for us to uh, to have a voice in that conversation, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, as you said, this this was the impetus for the massive May first gun ban, and so we'll see if uh, if a gun ban will help prevent something like this in the future. You know, anyway, I have my thoughts about that, as you know. Um, oh yes, of course. Yes, all right. Let's keep going. The next thing we uh, want to do is, oh yeah, the long gun registry data was found out that the RCMP have a working copy of the long gun registry. Um, I don't know. We knew that. We know one copy exists in a safe at, uh, I think it's um, at Justice, uh, because it was preserved when the data was supposed to be destroyed because there was an ATIP for that information that was Mm -hmm. active. Um, And somehow these copies keep floating around. We knew it in in High River. It was completely obvious nothing happened. Uh, and then the, the liberals get in, they say, you know, in Bill C-71 say, well, yeah, we actually still have the, the, the registry data. And if Quebec wants a copy, we'll give it to them. That's in the legislation. I don't know if ever, right. anybody remembers that. So while this is like, yeah. oh, look, they've got the data. I don't know. It's kind of really a nothing burger. We knew that already and nothing's going to happen. Yeah, we already knew that. And I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, we're governed right now by a liberal um, a liberal government, there isn't going to be any political will there to go out and beat up the RCMP for not following the 2013 legislation that said it should be destroyed, right? They're, they're not upset about that. Um, however, we do have um, Shadow Minister for Public Safety, Shannon Stubbs, who is always in the corner of legal gun owners. She has written to RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky. We'll see what comes of that. I mean, you know, I... Again, it's just it's just the liberal way, right? Nothing's truthful, nothing's honest. It's there's secretive stuff going on, and you know it's not shocking or surprising in the least to anybody who's been paying attention. Um, but it's just yet another occasion of it. So yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah, the rules don't apply to them. Um, of course. Not. All right, so it's time to do the neon sign draw. Yay, right. this is the best part of the whole day. Yeah, for sure. I Okay, so I set up something here. I, like last time, if you guys saw the draw last time, what I did was I narrow the screen and then I hide half of the name column so I'm not revealing anybody's name or their contact information. So what you're going to see on the screen is the um, the city, the first name of the person, 
who entered the city and their province. And then these are in order of who entered, you know, so if you entered right when the next contest opened, your name is probably first up here and, uh, and the number of times that you entered is here too. So let me get this going. All right. So how we're doing is we're going to random.org. We're going to do a number range and randomly pick the, uh, the winning number. So we've got column one all the way through column Column 1276, Garrett. Whoever Garrett is, he's in Chilliwack with me right now. That's awesome. Uh, 1276. So 1 through 1276. One. Now, just a reminder to everybody, this is for the Firearm Rights or Human Rights neon sign. So as you know, we're going to light up 2021 with different signs every month. We drew for the CCFR logo one first. That's gone. We got a great picture from the winner. He's got it up in his gun room. It looks fantastic. So this is for the next one, which is the firearm rights are human rights. And it's huge, like three feet across. It's insane. Super awesome. Awesome. All right. Here we go. I'm going to hit generate. Do it. 80. Who, Number 80. Who's Ooh, an early entry. It's on line 80. Oh, 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 oh. Justin from Port Coquitlam. I'm going to get his last name, but I'm not going to. Well, I mean, I can show that, but everybody else's will will show up. So I'm going to go back here. There we go. Justin. From Port Coquitlam. Oh, out by you. Justin Prang. All right, Justin, congratulations. You got the Fire Rights and Human Rights congratulations, sign. Justin. That's, yeah, that's, that's really exciting. Yeah. I mean, these signs are awesome. They're going to look great in your place, wherever that is in Coquitlam. So thanks, everyone, for entering. Really appreciate the help. Um, again, you can enter this contest by donating $10 only to the CCFR and you get a free entry into the contest. Make sure you check out all the rules. Um, and, um, and yeah, it just helps. Uh, if you, if you donate in through the link that's in the description box below, uh, if you donate uh, $30, you'll get three entries free into the contest. Mm -hmm. So we just want to incentivize people to, to keep supporting us. And we think this is a great way to do it, but now Wilson, this is the exciting part. It's time to unveil this, part, so. this month's sign. Yes. So I'm going to reveal it. So should I pull it down first? I'm going to uncover it. I've got it hidden up here. I'm like Vanna White. Uh, you should turn it on first. So it's. So it's ready to go. Yeah. Hit the remote control. Okay. So I'm like, I'm like a, a carbine Vanna White. Let's see what we've got here. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> These guns are not for sale. Not for sale. I, I don't know. Is this for Bill Blair or is this a prize? I'm not, I'm not really sure. That's great. These guns are not for sale. So this thing is huge. I don't know. I'll, I'll get up here. I am, I am like five feet tall. Look at the size of this yeah, sign. Yeah. I can't even reach the other side of it. It's massive. Yeah, it's awesome. It, it's ridiculous. It's awesome. Somebody's going to love that. And of course, um, it looks great in any gun room or your man cave, your lady cave, wherever you want to put it. I personally think everyone should have one right in their front window of their house. Yeah, that's that's awesome. These guns are not for sale. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be better. All right. I want to mention one more thing. Um, so okay. what we're doing is we're trying to incentivize people to enter each month, right? Uh, that this is going yes. on. And I mean, if, if, you know, if you entered and, you know, you sent us a hundred dollars and you had 10 entries and you didn't win, of course it's disheartening. Um, keep in mind mm -hmm. what your, your odds are. I mean, we had 1,275, 76, something like that entries into this. So those are pretty, yeah. pretty decent odds. Right. Um, but what we're going to do is we want to incentivize you to jump on to yeah. this month's, um, contest. So here's what we're going to do is if you enter the contest this month, we're going to do something called a rollover. That means everyone that enters this month automatically gets those same amount of entries into next month's draw as well with the people that enter into next month's draw. So mm -hmm. there's a one time only thing that we're going to do this. We're going to call it the rollover. So if you enter this time, you're actually entering for two signs. And you know. I think that's a great idea because I know everybody's going to go crazy for this. I know they're going to love it and you're right. It is hard when you want a lot of entries because it's, it's multiples of 10, right? right? So 
yeah, you throw in 50, 100, 200 bucks. It's hard to do that every month. I get it. So this is a great opportunity to have those uh, chances roll over. Um, and yeah, we'll just keep drawing these signs. I just can't get over it. I'm going to I'm gonna have a really hard time parting it. It's awesome. Yeah, that's pretty cool. All right. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, we've got everything dealt with. No? I think so. Yeah. I um, Maybe just one quick last thing is uh, we're proud to announce that the CCFR will once again be the national sponsor for Project Maple Seed. That is uh, an amazing organization that um, um, focuses on marksmanship, really teaches people uh, the basic skills um, on how to shoot. And it's just a super grassroots program. Even last year during COVID, with all the shutdowns and things going on, they were still, really? still able to pull off 60 events. So they're creating marksmen out of uh, gun owners everywhere. So we're proud to support their program again. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? We probably don't talk about it enough. I mean, it's such it's it's an extremely accessible program. You know, you need mm -hmm. a 22, right? And you'll learn all yep. kinds of really great basic skills. And, and it's good for your entire family. It's great for kids. It's great for adults. It's great for, for seniors who are looking for something exciting to do. Right. It's a it's a mm -hmm. it's a great opportunity. I haven't been there myself because I haven't even had time to shoot guns other than my. I don't think I've gone to the range in a year. Yeah. Well, I yeah. haven't shot a oddly enough. So it's, it's getting personal now, but I haven't shot a handgun since before COVID. Ah, yeah, it's that's, that's, that's terrible. That. Now, don't get me wrong. I've been training with rifles because I do my obligatory training actually on a regular basis because you have to stay sharp. But yeah, I haven't shot a handgun. Well, so anyway, we should make like a, you know, a. A new third wave um, promise to each other that we're going to try and get out to the range third in the next wave. 30 days. <laughs> the th I don't know. The third well, wave it's not, challenge. It's not Christmas or New Year's. It can't be a resolution. Yeah. So it's the third wave of COVID. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. So. You got you to gotta get up there and, and throw uh, throw lead down range if you possibly can. I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I can do that in the forest out here. We have mountains everywhere and lots of of uh, empty land for for me to go set up all my targets and run around like a total maniac but um but yeah that's fine yeah so anyway maple maple seed is just a really great opportunity to get out and uh and and do some really inexpensive shooting because it's all 22 and it's uh it's just a, it's a really good cause and we're really happy to stand behind them absolutely awesome all right well thanks for the update yeah check out the sign thanks for the update we really appreciate it we'll see you soon tracy all right ron take care all right, everybody, that's going to do it for episode 91 of the CCFR Radio Podcast. Um, thanks to Tracy Wilson for all her work. And I just, again, want to just say thanks to all of you guys. The level of support that we get from the community is, it it makes all of the things that we do possible. And, you know, I'm, I'm always thanking you guys. I mean, you're probably sick of hearing that. But it's not just for the support that you guys give us that allow us to do big things, right? The biggest things. But just that you you trust us and that you believe in us and that what we're doing is, you know, is sufficient that you that you support us the way that you do. So I just I really appreciate it. We're 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 trying unconventional things all the time. We're working ourselves to death to try to do everything we can to hold on to our guns. And you know, we're not going down without a fight. And we couldn't do it unless you helped us do it. Because stuff costs money. We have to raise money in, in order to spend it on advocacy. And the only reason we can do it is because of the trust that you guys have in us. So thank you so much for that. All right. And now speaking of donations, if you want to donate $10 or more uh, to the CCFR or in, in multiples of $10, you can do that and get entered into the Light Up 2021 contest, which you just saw someone win a great sign. And, uh, and the next one is really awesome as well. I will put the link in the description box below in this video and uh, you can enter it that way. Thanks very much everyone for all your help. Take care and we'll see you soon. This is another episode of the CCFR radio podcast. Remember, if you don't stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms, who will? Join the CCFR or donate right now at www.firearmrights.ca.